we're going to talk about how to become a good sleeper. So um, briefly, we'll talk about what is sleep, why it's important, the link between sleep and cancer, um, insomnia, how to make changes, and the biggest part is about strategies to improve your sleep. And we'll uh, try some relaxation techniques as well. And also, if you have any questions at any time, just, just ask them, okay? So sleep, so the quality of your sleep and getting enough of it, so the quantity um, is just as important as food and water is to our body. And contrary to what we used to believe, brains are actually very active during sleep. We used to think that it was just very passive, uh, but actually our brain is very much working hard during this time. But there's still a lot of things that we don't know about sleep. We're not quite sure why we dream or what's the function of it. So we're always learning new things about it. <clears throat> so um, what does sleep do? Um, it helps us to maintain and create new memories. So when we, I'll tell students when they're learning when they're trying to study for a test, the best thing you can do is get a good night's sleep because whatever you studied needs to go into your long-term memory. And that only happens when you're sleeping. So in order to remember things, we need to sleep. And I'm sure you've all noticed when you're tired, it's harder to concentrate and to respond quickly. So that affects our concentration there. And sleep plays um, kind of a housekeeping role and that it removes toxins in your brain that builds up while you're awake. So it cleans everything out. And it affects um, most tissues in our system. So from the brain, the heart, lungs, um, the immune function, our mood, and our resistance to disease. And if we get chronic lack of sleep or poor quality sleep, um, it increases the risk of disorders like high blood pressure, cardiovascular, diabetes, depression, and obesity. So it has a link to many illnesses that we know. So a little question for you. What percentage of your life do you think is spent sleeping? Anybody wants to try to guess? 30%. Rachel says 30%. And that is correct. It is you get eight hours a day. <laughs> yep, 30% of your life on average um, is spent on sleeping. So that's quite a big chunk of time, right? Yeah. So how much sleep do you need? Um, well, your need for sleep and your sleep patterns change as you age. So I'm sure babies, we know need a lot more sleep. And as we get older, we need less. But there's still no magic number that works for everybody of the same age. So we know some people that need less and some people need more, but on average for an adult, it's around seven to nine hours of sleep a night. Our, after 60, uh, because of menopause and different change, things that happen, um, your sleep tends to be shorter, lighter and interrupted by multiple awakenings. But we know that over people get less sleep than what they really need because of you know work, that we do because of having children, all kinds of reasons why. And we often feel that, well, I'm not sleeping during the week, but I'll sleep on the weekend and I'll catch up on what I've missed. But depending how sleep deprived you are, it may not work, it may not be enough. Um, so we have to be careful with that because you know, the more you're in the minus, it gets harder to catch up on the, to get to even it out. And sometimes you just can't. <clears throat> so I did a little bit of research about what's the link <clears throat> between sleep and cancer. And what I found out is that people that work long stretches of shift work are at an increased risk for certain types of cancer uh, because of um, disruptions in your in your clock. So your normal circadian rhythm is changed, right? Because you're supposed to be 
Normally we sleep at night, we're awake in the day. If you do shift work, it's you're all over the place. So it raises your, your chance of cancer, of breast cancer, colon, ovary, even prostate cancer. And they're not quite sure why, but they think that it's exposure to light while working overnight, over that this is over long periods of time, um, reduces your level of melatonin, which is needed for sleep. And that this may actually encourage cancer to grow. So one of the things they recommend is if you are a shift worker to do um, more maybe screening to make sure that you catch it because we know you're at a higher risk for those types of cancer. We also know that cancer treatments and its side effects and the emotional part of it also will disrupt sleep. Um, so it can be anxiety, depression, fatigue, um, problems with your digestive systems, breathing, hot flashes, night sweats, pain, there's all kinds of side effects there that will also have an impact on your sleep. So when we talk about insomnia, there's different types and depending on the type you have can be an indication of what's causing you to not sleep well. Um, so if we talk about onset insomnia, so it's a difficulty falling asleep. When you go to bed, you lay on your pillow and it just can't fall asleep. Um, and sometimes that can be related to not having enough melatonin producing in your system so that you can fall asleep. If you talk about maintenance insomnia, it's a difficulty staying asleep. So um, it's waking up frequently during the night and then having a hard time falling back asleep. So it takes you more than 30 minutes. And then you have early awakening. Uh, so that's waking up too early and difficulty going back to sleep. So you can go to sleep and you stay asleep for a good stretch of time, but at three in the morning, you're awake and you can't go back to sleep. So depending on knowing that, what, what is it that's bothering me? And sometimes it's a combination. You have a hard time falling asleep, but you wake up early. So knowing all that um, helps you kind of figure out what you need to do to improve your sleep and what strategies would work for you. So how do you make changes? So if you don't have any problems with your sleep, you can afford to be more flexible. So you know, you, you can go to bed later or wake up later and it won't affect you as much. But if you do have problems with your sleep, you do have to be more structured and disciplined in order to prevent um, having sleep problems. And we'll talk about a number of strategies, but don't try to do them all at once because that gets way too overwhelming. So what I would suggest is start about introducing one strategy at a time, see what impact it has, what it does, and then go from there. Because if you try, you know, it's like try a new diet and you eliminate everything at the same time, you just you don't stick with the program. Um, <clears throat> another thing that can help and often if you go see um, your doctor, they will often appreciate having this already because it can help them figure out why you're not sleeping if you have a problem. So keeping a sleep journal for a few weeks to find if there's patterns, if there's triggers. So in this journal, you would keep information about the quantity and the quality of your sleep. So how many hours did I sleep? How many times did I wake up? Did I feel rested when I woke up? your level of arousal throughout the day. So, you know, I woke up, I was fine, but then at two o'clock I was exhausted. I had to take a nap type of thing, or I was good. I had energy all day. Um, if you did any physical activity, um, if there were any stressors, was there any stressful, did you have bad news that day? Did you um, had stress at work? Anything like that, that could have an impact that we know and medications, because we also know medication plays a role. And any other relevant information that you would think could be related to your sleep. So this helps us to see, oh, okay, there seems to be a pattern here or not. That's why I'm not sleeping. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about strategies that can help us. And it's not, I don't have a magical wand 
I can't make it all perfect all the time. And these are just things that we know help, right? It's not gonna be perfect, but it helps us get there. So only going to bed when you are tired. And it seems pretty easy to understand, but then people will say, oh, well, I need to go to bed at 10 because 10 is my bedtime. But if you don't feel tired at 10, well, you're not going to go to sleep right away. And that creates a cycle. So waiting until you're tired to go to bed is one strategy. Having a schedule. So the same thing we do with kids, we want to do with ourselves, right? So you go to bed and wake up at the same time each day. And that's even on the weekends. So if you know, for example, I need roughly eight hours of sleep and I have to get up at seven in the morning. So that means I have to be in bed by eight, what, 11? 11 o'clock. Um, that means I need to be asleep by 11. So I get eight hours of sleep in my night. So then you can build your schedule around that and sticking to it as much as possible, even on weekends when you say, oh, I don't have to get up this morning. But that's how you would get help your, your problems with sleep. And again, the same thing you would do with a child. You need to have a routine in, bed, in place. And your routine, when you think about children, can be, you know, you take a bath, you put your pajamas on, you have a snack, you read a book. Those are all things to help you get get your mind ready, get your brain thinking, oh yeah, bedtime's coming, we're starting to do these things. So you wanna do the same thing with yourself. Um, so it, it doesn't need to be very complicated, um, like a 15 minute thing that you do can be good as well. It's just, as you do it every night, it trains your body into this is the time we go to bed. So we can also look at the physical environment where you sleep. So your bedroom, um, avoiding bright lights and um, loud sounds. Okay, so if you have a husband that snores next to you, like I do, sometimes you just need to go sleep in the other bed and that's okay. Um, and if you have, you know, lights, like the light from your, from your alarm clock, sometimes they're bright. Well, sometimes, you know, you just turn it around or do something so it's very, very dark. Or maybe some people sleep better with a sound machine, right? Having like a fan on that drowns out all the sound in the house that helps them fall asleep. So whatever it is for you that you need, making sure you have it. Uh, keeping the room at a comfortable temperature. So most people sleep better in a cooler room. So we say between 15 and 19 degrees would be around ideal. And don't watching t not watching TV or having a computer in your bedroom. So those are things about the physical environment that we can look at and see, okay, are there changes I can make around here? Avoiding stimulants. So avoiding caffeine late in the day. And when we say caffeine, that includes, you know, pop, chocolates, all of those things, right? Because they all add up together. Um, and late in the day, you know, after four o'clock would be kind of the cutoff. So it has time to get out of your, of your system. As well as medication that can contain stimulants. So cold medication, sometimes you'll see the nighttime ones. For me, at least it does that. It will prevent me from falling asleep. So watching what's in your medication as well can also play um, a role in that as well. So um, alcohol and nicotine before bedtime, because alcohol um, can sometimes be at the beginning, the first, the first glass of wine can be somewhat of a stimulant. Um, however, it is the opposite. It makes you fall asleep long, well, the more you have, but it also affects the quality of your sleep. So it's not really a good strategy either for falling asleep. Um, drinking, so avoiding too much liquids, um, whether it's juice, water, tea, coffee, because obviously it will make you have to pee multiple times in the night. So if you don't want to have to get up to pee, drink less 
drink your water early in the day so you have time to eliminate it so that at bedtime you can sleep. Um, avoid meals, heavy meals, um, two to three hours before bedtime. So if you, you know, work your clock back, say I need to go to bed by 11, so three hours before or two hours before, I need to have eaten by nine. Um, that's pretty late anyway. Doesn't mean you can't have a snack before bedtime, but something light. You know, you don't want your big turkey dinner right at nine o'clock when you need to go to bed at 10. We all know what happens. Screen time. So, and screen time, when we talk about screen, it's phone, tablets, computers, TV, and at least 30 minutes before bedtime, shutting them off. The thing with, with screen time, it's the blue light. So the blue light that comes out of it creates, not creates, but encourages melatonin to be created, uh, no, no, not created. Sorry, let me, the blue light prevents melatonin from being released. And in order to fall asleep, you need melatonin. So it, it's stimulating you as opposed to making you fall asleep. So one strategy would be to reduce your screen time. And it's, it's really about finding what works for you. Personally, I can watch TV, go to bed, doesn't bother me, but for some people, it will really make a difference. Naps, so avoiding naps in the late afternoon or in the evening. And if you feel you really just can't cope, I need to have a nap, 20 minutes. So 20 minutes will allow you to feel refreshed, but won't get you drowsy into a, a deep sleep in the middle of the day that would prevent you from falling asleep later on at night. So if, if you need to have a nap, do that. Physical activity. Uh, physical activity is great for sleep. So at least 20 to 30 minutes a day. Um, how, it's a timing of it that becomes a problem. You don't want it um, you know, a few hours before you have to go to bed. And outside is even better because then you get um, the blue light from the sun, which you, know, you want that during the daytime, not at night. So. 20 to 30 minutes a day, hopefully before you go to bed and outside. <laughs> so what if you tried all that, you're still awake, don't lie in bed awake, okay? Um, if you can't get to bed after 30 minutes, you're better off getting up, doing a quiet activity. So whether it's Sudoku's or crosswords or knitting or whatever occupies your mind, but physically, not physical activity, until you feel tired and, and then try again, okay? Because what happens, and I'm sure we've all done it, we spin in our beds and we look at the clock, oh, it's three o'clock, okay, if I fall asleep now, I still have four hours of sleep, I'm good. <coughs> oh. All right. So, and we also, it, if we don't fall asleep, it creates anxiety the next time because then you worry, oh, I'm having such a hard time falling asleep. Is it going to be the same thing the next day? So, you don't want to create that association. So, you're better off get out of bed, do something else, try again. If after another 30 minutes you're out of sleep, get out of bed again. Do something quiet until sleep comes. Because it can become a, vi a vicious cycle of, I can't sleep, I stay in bed, I associate my bed with anxiety and it makes it harder to fall asleep. So the bed has one purpose and that's to sleep. And uh, intimacy is the only second one allowed. So the bed is not the place to eat, pay your bills, study, 
All of the other things we can think of going in bed, that's not it. Bed is for sleeping and intimacy only. And again, <coughs> it goes back to, we wanna keep that association between bed, sleep, right? So that our mind knows that our bed is for sleeping and we stay with that connection. If worries, so let's say for some people, um, they can't fall asleep because they keep having the little hamster in their head of, I need to do all these things, or I'm worried about this. These are some strategies that can help you. So if you worry about, okay, tomorrow I need to call the doctor and I need to do groceries, I need to do this, I need to do that, then try writing down your list. So have a piece of paper next to your bed and write it out. And then when you start worrying about the list, you say, no, I have it right there. I wrote it down. I'm not going to forget. So that's one way of taking that out of your mind, putting it on paper so that you can fall asleep. If your worries are more, um, it's not a to-do list, but it's more, oh, I'm worried about how my daughter is doing in school or, um, you know, I have a doctor's appointment. What is he going to tell me? And all these more vague worries. Uh, keeping a journal by your bedside and just writing them out. Often when we just write them out, it, it's a way to get them out, even if you're not talking to anybody. And then they don't become so big. So then it helps you fall asleep. So that you get it out of your system, you wrote it down, and then you can fall asleep. So for that, for some people, that works. So writing it out. And finally, um, there are different relaxation or grounding techniques um, that can help you physically and mentally relax. So we talk about, I'm sure you've heard about deep breathing um, that you can do. There's also, and we'll do this one, the five, four, three, two, one. It's a grounding technique that works for anxiety, but also works for sleep. And you can do things like visualizations. There's different strategies you can try. So grounding, <clears throat> five, four, three, two, one. So I'm not very, um, I'm not a very, you know, people will say like meditation and things like that. I'm not very much into that. That's just not me. I'm very much more practical and needs senses to make something out of this. So this is a way to use your senses to ground yourself. So when you have that worry, the little hamster in your head that go keeps going, you can't worry and focus on what's around you at the same time. So if you only focus on what's around you, you can't have the hamster go. So it's what you see, what you feel with your body, things you hear, things you smell, and things you taste. So if you're trying to fall asleep, obviously my eyes are closed, so I will visualize what's in my bedroom. So I'll say, okay, I have a dresser, I have a lamp, I have <clears throat> a cat on my bed, things that I know are in my bedroom. So things that you feel, um, it can be, I feel the sheet over myself. Um, I can feel the weight of my cat on my legs. I can feel the wind if the window is open. So it's really focusing on what's really right now happening. Things you can hear. So I hear my husband snoring. I hear the cat purring. I hear the fan going. Um, really focusing on what's going on around you. Things you can smell. So sometimes you can't smell anything. If you don't, then I'll think about smells that I love. So I love the smell of coffee. I love the smell of lemon. Okay, so things that you enjoy. And things you can taste if it's bedtime, I'll say, oh, a taste the toothpaste in my mouth or a taste that you enjoy things like that. And you repeat it. You do it once. Sometimes I have to do it a couple times before it helps you calm, but it generally works. And this you can do even if you're feeling anxious in the daytime, you're driving in your car, you can do what's, what's five things I see, what do I feel, what, okay? So it's really focusing on the moment, on what's your body feeling, as opposed to what's in your mind. And the other one that I use, um, again, because I'm not a very Zen meditating person, 
um, it's progressive muscle relaxation. So I don't need to be thinking about anything in my mind. I just need to practice deep breathing. And it's really about tensing and releasing muscles in your body. And again, this, you can do it anywhere. I could be at work sitting at my desk and I can practice this. Because <clears throat> we know um, that when we get stress or tense, our body will naturally, right? The shoulders rise when we're stressed. Um, and we don't always notice it. But if you intentionally tense those muscles and then releases them, you feel the relaxation and it helps you. Um, and if you go um, online, you can find even guided ones. So you can do a video, it will tell you what to do. So if you Google guided progressive muscle relaxation, you can find guided ones that walk you through the whole thing. Um, and eventually you, you remember it, then you can do it. <coughs> So for example, here for the forehead, so scrunching your forehead, right? Like, so that you can get all the, all the, well, the wrinkles out in, so you see the wrinkles, right? Um, and squinching your eyes and then releasing them, so making a fist and then letting it go. Or the one for me, I know my, my anxiety goes in my shoulders. So if you just raise your shoulders, like you're gonna try to touch them with your ears and then you hold it for 10, 15 seconds and release. And then you feel, oh, I feel better. So this is something you can do when you're laying down in your bed. Or you can do even one year in the daytime. So any questions, any things you wanted to have more information on?